Call to order. This is the 20th regular meeting of the 2010-2011 Common Council. I would like to welcome back our city clerk, Sue Richards. Okay, thank you. And she will read us the quote of the evening. Thank you very much. Teamwork is the ability to work together toward a common vision, the ability to direct individual accomplishments towards organizational objectives. It is the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. Thank you, Sue. Roll call, please. Boren. Here. Bauk. Here. Bowers. Here. Decker. Excused. Hammond. Here. Hanna. Here. Heidemann. Here. Ka. Here. Kittleson. Here. Montemayor. Here. Rinfleisch. Here. Raisler. Here. Sampson. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Versi. Here. And Wangaman. Excused. 14 present. We have a quorum. Looking for President Kittleson to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gene. Looking for approval of the minutes of the former or the prior common council meeting, President Kittleson. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve the minutes of the last council meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second under discussion. There is no discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving all the way down to public forum. Okay, this evening we have one person, Tom Jensen, please. Good evening, Tom. Could you give me your home address, please? Yes, my address is 1754 Camelot Boulevard. Okay, and you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, City Council members and Honorable Mayor Ryan. Um, I, you have my name already. I'd like to uh, thank you, the Council, for the adjustment on the warranty adjustment you did on South 18th Street. I appreciate that, and we all do. Uh, but there is one thing that uh, a lot of us property owners out there are concerned with. It's called assessment on corner lots. Okay? I've, I'm retired, so I got the time to do this, the investigation through the state and everybody else, and you actually verbatim and copied what the state has in their legal manual. Everyone familiar with that? For the, that's for assessments. And uh, believe me, I've had the time to read it five, six times and do my highlighting. And I do have some comments here on special assessments for corner lots, okay? The linear footage of a Frontage assessed for any parcel. Okay, that's frontage assessment. Now, when we talk about frontage, that is what your address is. Okay, not your budding, but your uh, frontage. Your parcel, your property, according to county, is your address in the front of your lot, which faces the main street that you're addressed to. You get your taxes sent to you by your main street address, not the corner lot of 18th and Camelot. But your address is your frontage of your property. I know there's been some arbitration and some questions in, in different departments within the city itself in regards to assessing abutting properties. Okay, according to um, the state statutes and um, other statutes we'll I'll bring up here, but uh, we should be assessed for our frontage. It would be, still be an advantage to me because my abutting property is 111 feet to 18th Street. My frontage is 81 feet. And there's a lot of people that have the same situation there. But according to state statutes, we are supposed to go by your frontage. Unless you were never assessed on, or you have service coming off the abutting property, such as uh, gas, water, sewer. But my situation, I do not have, and I know there are a lot of other people that don't have that situation. <clears throat> there are some other uh, institutes here not to exceed 120 feet, but we don't have to go into that. But provisions by uh, Wisconsin State Statutes uh, 66.0703 relating to paving and relations to the paving and resurface of streets, alleys, and provided so on and so forth against property benefited thereby. According to state statutes, assessment is presumed to be based on actual benefits. Okay, they plan on narrowing 18th Street. 
and I'd like to get into that later on if I got the time, if it allows, but uh, we have to be, know what the actual benefits are according to state requirements. Uh, if the uh, charging only a limited number of properties for any improvement which benefits entire municipality constitute taking a private property for public use without the owner's consent. This is a violation of state and federal constitutions. And the uh, state and federal constitution is the fifth and the 14th amendment, uh, 14th amendment to the United States Constitution itself. State uh, taxing powers. Now that was utilized for actually emphasizing this reconstruction. According to your June, was it 14th or 17th of uh, last year, you made the motion, a resolution was uh, submitted to actually take the necessary steps for South 18th Street to be reconstructed under taxing assess or taxing pol or policing taxing assessment. Okay, the benefit, okay, policing and taxing assess assessment is taken on the difference between the established selling price of the property between and after installation of the improvement. Now, after you put in 18th Street, a lot of people are out there asking, why well, are we going to be a reassessed for it? According to this here, no, you can't because we are not, we're already paying for improved roads, living on improved roads. You can't come back and say, oh, we're going to absorb this through raising the taxes, the assessment property tax. You can't, not by state law. Okay, power and assessment uh, benefit extends well if you have a method uh, must be reasonable, not arbitrarily or burning any group of property owners. A mere claim on part of the governmental unit that the property is benefited is insignificant to support a special assessment, and that's by state law. Okay? Um, I myself, I'm happy that you dropped the price, but please come and give me the proper assessment, which is my frontage. Excuse me, Not my abutting. Would you like the additional Move minute? Move Please. Second. Second. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and front footage assessment right out of the state manual itself. The total front footage of each abutting property times the average project cost per front could then be used and measured the special benefits conferred on the specific parcel. This method of measuring benefits is generally uh, permissible under policing power, but there are some with just having abutting when your property fronts the road. Corner lots are required a special consideration. Hello, myself and a number of other people are in the same situation. And um, like I said, there's uh, there, there's more detail, but my time will probably not allow me to do that. Uh, I have other stuff, uh, state facilities, engineering, stuff like that, or the street from 48 feet back to back to curbs going the 40 feet front to front. And we pick it up from my investigation, my background. I checked. I used to work DOT. Okay, I was an inspector. And... Uh, so I, I, I know these requirements that they have, but uh, yeah, your time I, is up. <laughs> my time's up. Real quick here, please. Um, just the work's going to be done on Highway f Business uh, Road for uh, 141. The old 141 was a business route. Okay, that route is, from what I understand, is be done. I know it has been made public yet, but I found out from my information. Okay, where is this? traffic going to go to within a half mile South 18th Street which is con considered to be a collector road and if you go by state statutes and state design the 40 foot surface ha and 8 inches will not accommodate that traffic which includes long trucks which okay, is Tom, semi trailers Tom, we don't normally thank let you. people go any longer okay so. but that's it thank you thank you and as a uh, property owner that also lives on a corner lot with my my shorter uh, property being my frontage we appreciate your input. Okay, thank you. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Right, Corey? Yes, sir. It's all right. That thank you, Tom. Appreciate that's it. That's it for public forum. That's all for public forum. <laughs> we are looking for a uh, motion on the consent agenda. President Kittleson, 21 through 2020. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I move that all RCs be accepted and adopted, all ROs be accepted and placed on file, and all ordinance and resolutions be passed. Second. We have a motion and a second <clears throat> under discussion. If there's Alderman Bowers. Thank you. 
I just have a couple of questions. This is uh, nothing. 20-6, uh, 20 20.8, 20-13, 20-14, and 20-16. Let me take them in uh, numerical order. The, the first one, 20-6, 20.8, uh, deals with charter, and I'd just like to bring it to the attention of uh, our citizens that this charter is an increase. Uh, one is specifically for sports channels. One is quite an increase, at least 50%. The other ones aren't so big, it's only a dollar a month. Uh, the other one has something to do with the state. And it's going to cost the city roughly $32,000 uh, a year in lost revenue. And this has to do with charter collection of fees. So this is another mandate given to us by the state, which we have no control over. It's a minor adjustment, but I just want the citizens to know that uh, this is what we're faced with, with with the state mandates. Okay, 2013, 2014 deals with Allen L's uh, street celebration. I'd like to call attention to the certificate of insurance that was submitted to the city. I, I just believe it's an error, and a new one should be. It's the insurance says Sullivan Brothers, Inc., Post Office Box 7578, Madison. I don't know what the relationship is between Sullivan Brothers and uh, L&L's, but uh, it at the bottom it says certificate holder L&L's. L &L, City of Sheboygan should be the certificate holder and L&L should be the insured. So is there some way we can correct this so that they can get their uh, <coughs> permits uh, in order? Um, Alderman Bowers, if I can say one thing first. These are on the consent agenda. Normally on these discussions, they all go to a committee. They're all referred to committees okay, for discussion. Okay, I understand. Um, you know, just so we know protocol, normally discussion is done in committee. Uh, before it comes back to council, that's why <coughs> aldermen are invited to all committees. Then what is the purpose of the consent agenda if we can't call to make Did you attend the committee meetings on these Did I? documents? No. no, I didn't. Okay. So what are you saying now? You would like to change the certificate of insurance? Well, if the city doesn't care, I don't care. It's up to you, Mr. Uh, no, it would be up to the Common Council. So you're, okay. are you calling on the Common then Council Then why have the certificate of insurance? If it isn't correct. Like, like I said, Alderman Bowers, this is normally done at committee level. Yes. Vice President Rindfleisch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if there is an error, we can uh, uh, allow our departments to take care of that. Uh, we can still go ahead and approve the documents and <coughs> the, uh, um, on the consent agenda and direct the appropriate departments to continue doing so. We don't need to you know, micromanage everything. But uh, if it is truly an error, I trust the department will take care of it. We will refer that then to our... Uh, Does that come out of finance and on insurance? We can take care of it. Yeah. The city clerk will take care of that. What else did you want to discuss, Alderman Bowers? 2016, I just would like to, uh, I, I guess, fill me in on fixtures, disclaimer. If someone could just explain that for, in regarding 905 South 8th Street. Um, Chad Pelashek can explain that. <laughs> this is for the Harbor Winds property, the Harbor Winds Hotel. Uh, the City Redevelopment Authority owns the property underneath it, and they're, I believe, going through a refinancing process, and they have to, we have to sign off on this disclaimer of fixtures as part of that. And I think Steve McLean could answer any further questions, but it's related to the property ownership and the refinancing of the Harbor Winds Hotel. Fine. Does that answer it? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> to reply to you that that I attend meetings, we cannot attend every meeting. And if you think that I'm going to attend every meeting, the ones I can, I will attend. But when I'm reading this and it's on the consent agenda, I believe it's Alderman's job to call a correction when a mistake, an honest mistake, has been made. 
No, if you don't agree with that, I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep on calling attention. That is, that is fine, Alderman Bowers. I'm just saying protocol of council. You can contact the chairman of any committee. Yes. Ahead of the meetings to clarify these issues on the consent agenda. <clears throat> Normally, by the time it comes to council, all of these issues have already been discussed. They've gone to committee. They've been discussed in committee, and they're passed by committee before they come back to council. So in the future, I would urge you to please, if you have questions regarding any specific document, give the chairman of that committee a call, and possibly they can answer those questions <coughs> before you come to the council meeting. Do we have any further questions on the consent agenda? If there are none, roll call, please. Boren? Aye. Boak? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Aye. Was that an aye? Heidemann? Aye. Koth? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. And Versi? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. Communications and petitions 2021 through 2025 to be referred. Alderman Bourne? Thanks, Mayor Ryan. On document number 2022 from a communication from Margaret Jagler, uh, is that going to planning and public protection and safety? Uh, that is it. being referred to the plan commission and PPNS, correct? Thank you. Okay, moving on, reports of officers to 2031. We're going to hold for 2050. 2026 through 2038 to be referred. Resolutions introduced. Attorney McLean. Uh, on 2035, I, uh, that should be referred to the Redevelopment Authority and not the Risk Management. You are, you are correct. 2035 will be referred to the Redevelopment Authority. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Resolutions introduced three, 2039. We will hold also for 2050. 2040, by Alderman's Alder persons, Hannah, Hammond, Lauren, Montemayor, and Rinfleisch, approving the fiscal year 2011 one-year annual action for the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG program submission. Alderman Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I'd like to ask to suspend the rules. Second. And we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Any discussion on suspension of the rules? Is there anybody opposed to the rules being suspended? The rules are suspended. Thank you. Uh, secondly, I would uh, make a motion that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second to put the resolution upon its passage. Under discussion? Uh, just uh, a comment, because earlier some questions were asked about uh, the rationale for the distribution of the funds. Uh, each year that pool shrinks. And the, the group, uh, the consensus was we wanted to focus on, given the economic challenges right now, we wanted to focus on organizations that were going to have an impact on housing and really the care and well-being of, of those that are most challenged by the economy. Uh, so that's really what drove the decision um, for the allocation. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Hannah, excuse me. Is there any further discussion? There is none. Roll call, please. Bulk? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Ka? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? Aye. Samson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Versi? Aye. And Boren? Aye. 14 ayes. <coughs> Carries. 2041 and 2042 lie over. 2043 through 2045 to be referred. Reports of Committee 7, 2046, by law and licensing, recommending denying beverage operator's license number 8908 based upon her failure to include all relevant convictions on her application and her failure to cooperate with the committee. Vice President Rinfleisch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I move that the uh, report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept and adopt. Is discussion? Leah Kramer here? She's not here, Your Honor. Please continue. Thank you. Uh, based on um, the non-cooperation, she did have two uh, notices to uh, participate. She did contact us on the first notice and that she would participate in the second one and did not, and nor did call. So based on the non-cooperation and the disinterest in having her license, we recommend denial. 
Very good. Thank you. Vice President Rinfleisch, any further discussion? If there is no discussion. Roll call, please. Powers? Kudina, aye. aye. Hammond? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Koth? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Versi? Aye. Boren? Aye. And Bauk? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. 2047 by law and licensing recommended denying taxi cab driver's license number 8924 based upon his failure to include all relevant convictions on his application, his record of violations, and public safety concerns. Vice President Rinfleisch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second under it, discussion. Is Randall Graham here? He is not here, Your Honor. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Based on, um, yeah, Mr. Graham did attend and uh, discuss his uh, record with us. However, there were seven uh, convictions for felonies for burglary and two misdemeanor convictions for burglary uh, dating from 2004. Uh, based as such, we felt that it was not in the uh, public's best interest uh, to grant a taxi cab operator's license. Uh, so we recommend denial. Very good. Thank you, Vice President Rinfleisch. Any further discussion? There is no further discussion. Roll call, please. Hammond? Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hannah. Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Kath. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Raisler. Aye. Sampson. Aye. <clears throat> Vanderweel. Aye. Versi. Aye. Boren. Aye. Bauk. Aye. And Bowers. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. Reports of committees eight. 2048 by finance recommending authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract for camera equipment for the municipal courts. Finance. Alderman Hammond, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted and the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second under discussion. Alderman Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was a real hot topic. I got a lot of phone calls uh, and conversations with people uh, that really, under these tough budgetary times, don't see the reason that we're going to spend 25000 on a camera. Uh, the municipal court was held <coughs> here for three years, and I don't think we ever used the cameras while we're here. Um, so I'm not going to support it. Um, I think there's a better use for $25,000 in today's budget. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Alderman Raisler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm wondering if uh, Judge Tellham could come up and just kind of explain a little bit as to the needs of the camera. I think some of them, the Finance Committee, when we were there, I think the facts of, of everything and that being to broadcast kind of got a little bit clouded with some of the information with the paper. And I think that's where some of the phone calls came. I think maybe sure. we can have her come uh, up and explain. Do we need a motion to open the floor for the, for the judge? The She's the department. No. department. Katie? Hello. Uh, I made the request for the video cameras because uh, unlike uh, the circuit court where they have court reporters, in municipal court we're not a court of record, so we do not have the requirement to have a, you know, a, an employee there recording everything that is going on. <clears throat> However, the Wisconsin state statutes do require the municipal court to record uh, any proceeding in which testimony is taken under oath, and that's section 800.13. Um, and that recording is by mm -hmm. electronic means, and it's for the purposes of appeal. So uh, unlike, in the, again, the circuit court where you might have a transcript that will go up on appeal, municipal court is a little different in that uh, the defendant, ha well, either party actually has the right on appeal to have either the record go up so that would be what we currently take, and that is an re a, a audio recording. Or they can have uh, a new trial. So uh, last, I guess, March, when I was at a, a judicial conference, I was talking with some people. And as um, Alderman Hanna pointed out, I you know, years ago had decided that we wouldn't use the video cameras here. Um, but they were telling me what benefits there were to the video recording. Uh, because then when people took their appeal, uh, the, they tended to then just use the DVD. And therefore then, instead of having a brand new trial, 
um, which um, tends to be the favored method when you just have an audio recording, um, they would send the DVDs and the, then, you know, the witnesses being the citizens or the victims or the um, police officers don't need to take off work during the day and go over to the circuit court to have a you know, retrial of what they've already uh, gone through, um, saving time and money for everybody involved. And then they also pointed out that the circuit court judges tend to like it because <clears throat> it takes less time for them to quickly go through a DVD. They can fast forward on it and get to the relevant uh, points in reviewing the record. So um, that uh, kind of had me thinking about it. Uh, then this summer when I uh, happened to marry someone um, at the Sheboygan Yacht Club, the woman who was the bride happened to work for Fitchburg and their cable station, and she was telling me how great the um, use of the video is uh, uh, as a TV show. Um, and basically it comes down to uh, the educational value. Uh, if you you know, look at how many police officers and building inspectors the city hires. There, it's impossible for them to get to every single citizen and educate them as to what the law is. In municipal court, again, vast majority of people are pro se defendants. They might not be familiar with anybody talking to them about what the law is or how it's interpreted. And uh, oftentimes after a trial, I'll hear, oh, you know, I'm frustrated that I came because if I would have just known that this was the law, <laughs> I wouldn't have, you know, pursued it this far. Um, and so it's an educational process at trial, and the benefit then is for that one person that happens to, you know, have a citation, there are probably six more out in the city that are doing the same thing, thinking they're complying with the law, they're trying to be good citizens, but unfortunately they don't know, you know, what the law really is. Um, and so the, this educational value um, from the other courts that I uh, then talked to, uh, this, I talked to the judge from Fitchburg, um, they've been uh, having the video recordings for the past 19 years, Stoughton for 20 years, and then I called a more recent court to see what they thought as well, and the judge in Beloit, which I think is a community similar to ours, you know, really sung its praises and said, it's great for the community, it really does, um, you know, have a civic benefit in making our community a better place to live, because now people, you know, just more, pe you get to more people to let them know um, what those laws are and how they're interpreted. But, um, so that, is why then I decided that this would be a good thing for our community. It would help people understand the laws and how to comply um, and just get the word out to many more people than we can just by having trial by trial. These cases are open, you know, the, the um, record is kept by the clerk right now in audio record. Uh, the system that we have uh, proposed or had uh, uh, proposed to us uh, just requires the clerk to do the same thing. She's going to record and then download. Because it is a court record, there's no splicing, you know, no uh, editing allowed, in fact, and because it is a court record. And so it will go on just as, um, as recorded. Um, and again, we don't necessarily have to, you know, do the TV end, but we are requesting for the video uh, recording to get the electronic recording as required and to be in compliance with this statutory provision um, and allowing the record to go up on appeal, hopefully saving a lot of time and money for uh, everyone that is involved in those retrials. Um, I don't know if you have any thank, questions. Thank, thank you, Judge Delahunt. If you can just stay up there for a moment. President Kittleson. Thank you, Mayor. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Are we looking at the future? The vision is to save time and money, and I believe you just said that. I, I, you know, I think the the time just at the you know for the city's end. I mean, this isn't just the citizens that have to you know when uh, uh, Walmart you know has a retail theft case or uh, and their employees have to come over and testify or you know the city employees that have to come and testify. You know that the time and money saved, um, I think, is. <coughs> Yeah, it justifies it. Thank you, President Kittleson. Thank you. Alderman Bowers. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, have you had problems within the court itself with the participants acting up or anything like that? I was under the impression this was part of the uh, situation. No, um, you know, this is, uh, you mean uh, for the reason for videoing? Yes. No, the, um, the reason to video would not be to, I mean, people are going to behave how they're going to behave, I guess. Um, we do um, have, uh, you know, an occasional person who outbursts or gets frustrated, and then they're just advised to um, calm themselves down, and then we can continue on with the case. Uh, but I don't believe, uh, when I, in talking to the other courts, that was not even something that was brought up or addressed, and that was not something that I was looking to do um, for the recording. Uh, for that, I would prefer to have a bailiff in the courtroom. <laughs> that would be the, the uh, solution to any outburst kind of issues. But um, typically in the court, we do have police officers who are going to be testifying, so that kind of keeps everybody calm and, uh, and in order. But yeah, that was not even a, that's not a consideration and yeah. Okay, so your request was put in after the budget requests were put in, so this is sort of afterwards, right? We have um, the money in uh, the municipal court budget. Uh, I'm not asking for additional funds. Um, it was in our budget. It's nothing that we're gonna take out of the general fund. So you're gonna just allocate the 25,000 that would have been left there? In your, in your fund? Correct, I guess, yes. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Bowers. Alderman Hanna? Yeah, just help me understand. So the audio, um, the audio recording doesn't meet the requirements? No, the audio does. Okay, and how does the, Reason, how does the camera save employee time versus the audio? Well, again, because with an audio recording, the purpose of the, or the, the reason the statute require, requires a recording mm -hmm. is for appeals. Right. And we have this nuance with municipal court that a person can either take the record, and when the record as we have it now is an audio recording, they can take that and give it to the circuit court and the court can listen to the audio, or they can have the case retried. That's kind of a nuance. When you appeal from a circuit court case, it's on the record. It's a transcript. You don't get to retry your case. So what we have found in our court is that no one is using the DVD, <laughs> or I mean the, um, the audio. They want the new trial. And so, um, you know, and that's whatever. That's what, when I was discussing this with other courts, that tends to be the case. But when, it, when a case has been recorded on a DVD, people are satisfied with that and are okay with that going up on appeal rather than having to retry the case. And that's where you save the time and money because retrying a case, you know, obviously it's the people, again, taking off work, the police officers that need to go over, the city attorney that, you know, assistant city attorney that would need to retry the case, that employee time, the citizen's time, victim again, Walmart as the example for retail theft. Their loss prevention person doesn't have to come over or the Humane Society person doesn't have to take off work again and get over to the circuit court for the same trial they've already had. So. Alderman Henry. Yeah, I just. Uh, is that make, am I explaining it? Seems, it? Seems, well, it seemed like we, were, we didn't make a good decision moving you from here to there because this had all the equipment here. Well, uh, you know. I'm, if this was such a critical element, I mean, you had everything right here. I guess, you know, the, the, there are a lot of things that were installed in the new building, and this, you know, uh, camera equipment uh, isn't, I, I, I guess I don't see, I wouldn't have stayed here just for the camera equipment. Um, that, you know. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Alderman Hanna. Alderman Raisler. My question is, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just, just briefly, um, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I, I guess the question that, that I had or was answered, and I just want to uh, summarize that I think the phone calls we received or the additional information was because of the way that it was reported that this was going to be specifically for um, the Channel 8 <clears throat> 
segment, which is, is really a possibility in the future, but for right now, we'd like to use this video recording um, to save the money for the appeals and to provide a documented copy. Right, I mean, the initial thought for the cameras was we need a video recording for the record for appeal. Thank you. Yeah. The, the advantage to channel eight is so you can see your friends and neighbors. Exactly. Right, Stephanie. So. Alderman Rinfleisch, your question was answered. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Reisler. Alderman Bulk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, which I know you understand this, Judge, that $25,000 is a lot of money right now. Yes. It's, a, it's the benefit package for a full-time equivalent. So when people are calling in about that, it's because right I now appreciate is big that. money. Yes. Um, a, good, a couple of questions. How often in a given year will a case be appealed in this way where it can end up having to be retried? Right. And I did ask my clerk that because I get a lot of people who tell me they're going to appeal. So I said, well, how many appeals have we had? So in the five years that we've been you know, almost five years uh, that we've been running, we've had 27 appeals. Okay, and it, two, maybe three people that generally testify at, at a given, I'm just trying to do, you know, if it's a policeman and a city and another city employee? Or that, the varied? typical trial will have one or two police officers or one or two building inspectors, uh, the defendant, and then the de um, possibly, as I said, if it's a you know, like again, I'll go back to the Walmart example or a Humane Society employee. Those employees would come as witnesses as well. And then the defendant may have, you know, one or two witnesses. Okay. So give or take five times a year for three or four people. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just trying to talk about what it is. So it's five times a year and it's three or four employees that have to redo all this over again. Oh, uh, how about minors on film? Would that prevent you from broadcasting eventually on Channel 8? I know it wouldn't affect you keeping it for appeal purposes, but for broadcasting, if there are minors in it, does that prevent you? Uh, the uh, cases that are open to the public are the cases that would be uh, going on TV. So all juvenile non-traffic matters are not open to the public. Okay. And that's, you know, the, the, the thing here, this is not, these cases are any the courtrooms wide open and is the public is always invited in to these proceedings and should be attending the proceedings it's it uh, it's open to the public and so it's just showing what is open to the public now are those child non traffic cases are those liable to be appealed are those a high percentage of those appealed because of well, I actually involved, I don't know how many of those have gone on appeal. I didn't have the clerk break that down. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But when, and when they do, is it the same rules, even though it's a minor non-traffic, does it still, if it's an audio, they can retry it? Is it that same sort of deal? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. They would be able to, and it, it, the court though, obviously can have that record. It just would be, again, when they're playing it, it wouldn't be open to the public. Okay. And I, so f to my colleagues, I don't know what, I, I was in favor of it uh, in the finance committee because I, I inappropriately thought it was going to be money coming out of our TV8 fund that I thought had to be spent on AV stuff anyway. Now it's coming out of, you know, um, an account that could end up, you know, we could pay for half or we could pay for the benefits of a full-time equivalent. So that's got me kind of on the fence. So um, I am not sure what to do. So if more of you want to weigh in, I'd appreciate your, your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Bauck. Attorney McLean, you wanted to comment? Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to make clear that the if somebody has the right to appeal with a trial de novo at circuit court, whether, whether the recording is on audio or video doesn't make any difference. They still got a right to a new trial. Yeah. Uh, if it's on video, it doesn't mean they don't have a right to a new trial. They, they would still have that right. So whether you've got an audio recording or a video recording doesn't make any difference. Now maybe, maybe I think what the judge is getting at, maybe the defendant would decide mm -hmm. not to have a new trial since uh, there already is a video recording of it. I, I don't know. But that's and, well, and then I can just address that. You know, Fitchburg and Stoughton, both of those communities have been doing it for 19 and 20 years, have told me that that's their, that is what they have found then, that that's what happens. They go with the video recording. Not, and again, but that is not to say, who knows, here, <laughs> I don't know. You know you can, people definitely have the right to the retrial. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Alderman Hammond. Yep. Um, thank you. Hi, Judge Delahunt. How are you? Hello. Great. Um, I think you might have just answered this, but maybe you can numerically clarify it. What percentage of you know, Stoughton, Fitchburg, you know, when somebody does appeal and they have the video, what percentage of those result in a new trial? What percentage of those they just take the recording and, and go? 
100% of their cases go up on video. They don't have any retrials. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. And uh, last but not least, Alderman Raisler. Just for uh, Alderman Balk. You also remember we have the attorney's uh, time that's invested in two. So the time he's away from work and the time he has to travel to circuit court. Okay, thank you, Alderman Raisler. I have no more lights up here. <coughs> if uh, we can go to vote, thank you, Judge. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, um, we will do a roll call vote, and I will be to authorize the purchase. Okay, Hannah. No. Heideman? No. Ha? Aye. I'm sorry? Aye. <coughs> Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? No. Rinfleisch? No. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? No. Vanderweel? No. Versi? No. Boren? No. Bauk? No. Bowers? No. And Han No. No. Three eyes, 11 no's. Motion fails. Moving on. 2049. By finance, recommending authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2010 budget. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted and the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second under discussion. Alderman Bowers. Is this uh, 2042? Uh, we're on 2049 49. at the moment. 2049. I'm sorry. I, all right. No. Is there any discussion? We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Heideman? Aye. Kath? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Aye. Thank you. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Versi? Aye. Boren? <clears throat> Aye. Bauk? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Hammond? Aye. And Hannah? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. Okay, 2050, we are going to take uh, along with that, first of all, what we passed over, 2031, by City Planning Commission, recommending authorizing the sale of city-owned property at 833 Center Avenue. We are going to take 2039 with that. Um, by Alderman Han Hammond, authorizing the appropriate city officials to ac accept an offer to purchase city-owned land at 833 Center Avenue. And finally, we will get to 2050 by finance, recommending authorizing the sale of city-owned property at 833 Center Avenue and passing the resolution as is. Alderman Hammond, you get two out of three, so I guess you can. I can do three out of three if you need me to. Okay, we need uh, motions on all of them. We're looking at 2031, a motion to accept and file. 2039, a motion to file. And 2050, a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Alderman Hammond, could we just do the first two and then we'll do Absolutely. the- Absolutely, all right. On 2031 and 2039, I would um, make a motion to file. Second. We have a motion and a second on 31 and 39 to accept and file 2031 and file 2039. Under discussion? If there is no discussion, should we take these separately? Can we take them together? Together and then just in all eyes. Okay. Uh, if there is no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Now we will move on to 2050, which is by finance, author, recommending authorizing the sale of city owned property at 833 Center Avenue and passing the resolution as is. Uh, this is, uh, for those who are not in the know, the city engineering building directly across the street from City Hall. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted and the resolution put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second under discussion. Alderman Bowers. Yes. Uh, I see that it was placed on, my, uh, on our desk uh, an amendment by uh, Alderman Bourne, and this is for... Um, in lieu of property taxes that we charge a assessment fee, I guess they call it a pilot fee. Also, I was wondering what the appraisal was on this building because I know when it came up last year, we're selling it, I believe, for $199,000 plus 10 parking stalls, 
plus it's going to an organization that will not be paying any property taxes. Therefore, if I could have the uh, appraisal figure and also uh, the 10 parking stalls, was that included in the original <coughs> offer to purchase or offer for sale? Uh, it seems like a low price to me, and here we're not getting any money in property taxes, so uh, I would like some answers to those questions. Thank you, Alderman Bowers. First of all, uh, the latest appraisal <laughs> came in at $170,000 on the building itself. Um, we did include the parking stalls immediately behind the building that they, it would come with parking. Uh, it's at $199,000 as is, is the way this is reading. This is the... the uh, final agreement uh, signed by the Knights of Columbus and uh, uh, um, negotiated uh, through our uh, finance director, Jim Amodio. The 199,000 is as is. At one point there was a question about a crack that had formed in the back wall of the building. There was a question about drainage on the roof uh, and some other questions. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the Knights of Columbus always owned a property in the city of Sheboygan. It was up by what is now, it's torn down, it was bought by St. Nicholas Hospital. Um, as far as charging a payment in lieu of taxes to one organization and not others, uh, I don't think it is the city's prerogative to pick and choose. Uh, we have many other organizations which are benevolent organizations in town. Boys and Girls Clubs, Elks Club, Moose Club. VFWs, I believe, um, all of the churches in town, hospitals, uh, that do not pay taxes. Just because this is a city-owned building, uh, the payment in lieu of taxes is something different than the sale of the building itself. The Knights of Columbus have the right to go out and buy any other building in town and take it off the tax rolls. So what we need to look at with this issue, it's two issues. It's one, is $199,000 fair for the sale of that building? In my opinion, it is. That's a building in need of some repair. In this real estate market right now, which we how many vacant buildings there are downtown right now, um, if the city does not sell this <coughs> building, we could be looking at holding this property for a long time. We could be looking at holding this property for a long time and it will be in need of repair. So I think the $199,000 for this property is fair. Um, in spite, you know, in, the, in, in, in light of the real estate market at this point. As far as getting a payment in lieu of taxes, would I like to see a payment in lieu of taxes? Yes, I would. But I don't think it's the city's prerogative to pick and choose. To say this organization is going to pay taxes and this one is not. I believe if this council wants to put forth a resolution that says that all nonprofits are going to pay a payment in lieu of taxes for public protection and safety and for public works, that would be a different issue. And that would include all nonprofits. But I don't think it's the council's <coughs> prerogative to pick and choose some organizations that will pay a payment in lieu of taxes while others don't. That's my opinion. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor Ryan. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make my motion uh, to send council document number 2050 uh, of January 17, 2011, back to the city attorney and the city finance director to negotiate as a contingency of the sale of the city-owned property at 833 Center Avenue in the city of Sheboygan, Wisconsin to the uh, Columbus Institute an annual payment in lieu of taxes for police protection, fire protection, and public work services. The annual payment in lieu of taxes will be based on the portion of the current year's property tax level dedicated to providing police protection, fire protection, and public work services, and the current assessed value of said property. The annual payment in lieu of taxes will be renegotiated on an annual basis prior to December, 30, on, uh, prior to December 28th for the following year's pilot payment by the city attorney and the city finance director based on the annual changes in the property tax levy dedicated for providing police protection, fire protection, and public work services and the assessed value of the property for that year. The new amount <coughs> of the payment in lieu of taxes will be approved by the city finance committee on an annual basis. Second. 
Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Under discussion, Mayor, uh, before I get into uh, before I get into what, some of my prepared comments, I was a member of the uh, Building Use Committee last year, and the Building Use Committee last year, uh, first of all, uh, we we decided on your advice to hold off selling the building until real estate for commercial property is improving. To this point, I don't know if it is improving. And the second thing that you told the building use committee is that when this building was sold, you wanted it on the property tax rolls. So I don't know if Alderman Versi's committee has had any discussions on the sale of this building. I think at the very least it could have went back to the building use committee uh, to advise them what the city finance director was negotiating, but all of a sudden it shows up at the finance committee and it's all news to us. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that the Knights of Columbus is a wonderful organization and they do a lot of good work in, in the community. But, a, but as a fairness issue for the struggling ma and pa bar, bar businesses in the city of Sheboygan in my district and your districts, uh, I think uh, uh, that having them pay a payment in lieu of property taxes is just a fairness issue. Uh, we are not asking them to pay anything for the school portion of the levy, the county portion of the levy, or LTC. Just a payment for the services that, we, they, that they will directly benefit from. And I ask the council's support in sending this back to the city attorney and the city finance director for, for the further negotiations as a contingency to the sale of the property. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Alderperson Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When um, the Knights of Columbus were approaching and talking with the city about this property, were they, con were, was the information about payment in lieu of taxes presented to them at all? Uh, yes, it was. It was discussed on several occasions. If I can have uh, Director Amodio come up. Um, Jim, you are the kind of the uh, chief haggler in this negotiation. <laughs> yes, uh, they had made several offers and in some of the offers they wanted additional things. Uh, one of the things we said was 199 and a payment or a pilot in lieu of taxes uh, and they came back and said no on the pilot because they were a, um, a non-tax paying organization uh, that wouldn't be acceptable to them or their board. Uh, so we negotiated, uh, the last time we negotiated, there was a price of $199,000. There was at least a $3,500 escrow, could have been more. Uh, there were additional demands for a strip of land between that and the uh, transit uh, that they wanted, uh, along with an additional parking spot for handicap. Uh, <clears throat> it was the uh, Finance Committee's decision to say, uh, go back, make them one more offer, $199,000, no strings attached, as is, where is, no strip of land, no extra parking. That's what I was instructed to do. I did that. They accepted the offer and signed it. Thank you. As much as I would like them to do, you know, payment in lieu of taxes, I remember at the Plan Commission, we did have a quite of a firm discussion with another um, tax exempt a couple of years ago, and we in pretty much insisted on payment in lieu of taxes. Well, they just didn't buy our land at that. They did something else. I would definitely like them to pay something for the police and the fire and the, and the snow removal. But I don't want the sale to be contingent on them saying yes. I would ask that, I, well, evidently we did ask them to please do that simply as a, as a moral obligation. Um, that's all I have to say, thanks. Now on the snow removal of the parking stalls that they would purchase with the building, that would be their responsibility. Thank you. Um, so the city would no longer uh, plow that portion of the lot. Uh, the only reason that I, you know, num number one, uh, Director Amodio, can you give us some idea on the payment in lieu of taxes, what they would be paying on an annual basis well, based on this formula? Sure, when we looked at it, we looked at the police, fire, and public works budget against the total budget for the city. And in public works, uh, we took everything except garbage and parks and recs because they'd have to supply uh, their own garbage pickup and parks and recs wouldn't be affected. Once we did that, we then backed any revenue off of those three departments that they generate from the city. Once we got the net number, the net expense, 
which would theoretically be the levy value. We then looked at revenue. And revenue in the city, roughly $14 million of the $34 million is levy revenue. $16 million is not levy revenue, but it's shared revenue from state. So we then took the $16 million and apportioned it to the city budget because that would need to be shared. And then came up with a net cost for fire, police, and public works. And applying the credit um, also to the city rate, uh, the payment in lieu of taxes would be about $702 a year on $199,000 of assessed value. So that's the number we're talking about. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Director Amodio, um, Alderman Rinfleisch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as I'm in the, uh, the beer business, I uh, do see those customers that Alderman Bourne was uh, referring to. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that are, are barely making it right now who do pay their taxes uh, or struggle to pay their taxes at times, but uh, are, are paying their taxes. Um, and, and doing the right thing. Uh, a lot of the um, uh, nonprofits open to the public uh, really are open to members only, and very few are actually open to the public for, to uh, gain business, one of which is Knights of Columbus. So uh, you can go use their facilities and, and not have to worry about, um, well, they had the facilities, uh, and it is open to the public. It's my understanding. I'm not a member, uh, but that's my understanding of that. Uh, so I do agree uh, that, that without some kind of payment is not fair to those businesses that are doing the right thing for a business that's in direct competition with them to, uh, to not have to pay the taxes. Uh, however, when I look at the, uh, the resolution, um, we're also asking to negotiate. Uh, well, negotiation is a two-party thing. It's not un uh, unilateral. We can't simply demand that they, they accept our offer plus the 782, 792? 702. 702 dollars uh, uh, as calculated uh, for, a, for a pilot. Um, they can say no, and they can walk away from the deal and say no. Uh, at, at, at some part of me would be fine with them walking away and saying no, keep my fingers crossed, and hopefully we sell the property to somebody else. Um, but what happens if they say no? Uh, perhaps they move to another location in the city, they still don't pay any taxes, and they're not buying from us, so we have no leg to stand on to, to negotiate a pilot. Um, and we still have a building across the street that we need to fix. The older it gets, the more money we're going to have to invest in fixing that up to make it a saleable fixture. We have an offer right now that's as is, with no contingencies. Um, so I, uh, I know that there was, as you mentioned, there were other negotiations previous to that. So we know it's assessed at 172 without the parking stalls. Um, but what was their initial offer that came through? What were they asking for that they're not asking for right now? That probably a, another entity, if purchasing the same building, would probably do the same thing and ask for uh, in the first place. Well, they wanted another strip of land. Uh, they wanted to widen the drive by two or three feet, which meant taking out some lawn and some trees between them and transit. They wanted an additional spot for handicapped in the back. They wanted an island put in the back to separate their parking from the rest of the city parking. Can I? Please continue. Um, and they were asking for, they were offering substantially less money, correct? As Correct. well as contingencies, the city would have to spend some money, and I heard numbers anywhere from 15 to 25,000 to fix up the roof. Well, the roof is an issue um, because of the slope of the way the water drains. It could be anywhere from zero to <clears throat> maybe 20,000. <clears> the item they looked at was the flashing and the crack in the back wall, which we had estimated between 3,500 and $5,000. So that was always a moving target with them. <clears throat> Um, on the amount of escrow to see how much they could really get out of the city. You know, so, I believe the original, their original offer on a purchase price was 175, I think, when they mm -hmm. first came to us. Yes, I believe it was. Yeah, um, um, because of the assessed value at 172, that's or was what I heard. Previously. The, 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 they had it appraised at 170, and that was with one or two parking spots. One or two parking spots. They wanted 10. Um, and wanted to pay 175. Myself and the mayor and Chad talked, uh, and we went back, encountered with 199 and a pilot. Uh, they came back and said 199, no pilot. Uh, and then after that, there were another series of events where, once they had their foot in the door, they thought they can get some more. Uh, another and none of which was any different than any taxable entity would be if they offered for the same property. Correct. You know, we'd yeah. probably be looking at. Uh, 
spending some money on a roof prior to selling it to a tax yeah. entity. That is, that is the thing that this offer, I think, um, is, is advantageous for us is we don't have to put any money into the building. There's no uh, what ifs in this equation. I mean, the other thing that also happened was that we took some of the built-in cabinets when we moved to engineering, so we have some exposed walls. They're not opposed to that, uh, but there's exposed walls and flooring, which if we had to look at a resale, um, they'd have to be willing to accept that. Uh, Knights of Columbus said they were going to gut it in, inside anyway to the bare walls, so that wasn't a factor. But these could be additional repairs that we'd have to do if we try to sell it to a third party. So the thing that I'm be weighing as I decide this is the fairness factor to the competitive businesses, if you will, that I'm familiar with, versus I think, uh, in my mind, it's probably the best offer we're ever going to get for that property. And as is, we walk away. Is it taxable right now? No, but we're looking at $700 a year in, in taxable event versus what we may have to spend to make it sellable in the long run. So I'll weigh that decision and make up my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Alderman Rinfleisch, and, and that $700 a year could get eaten up very quickly if we're starting to carry costs on that building and repairs on that building. So, uh, One thing I'd like to point out, I mean, if we look at, I've got a list here of all our exempt properties in the city. And if we just go down a, a page here, we have parks, we have schools, uh, we have uh, Christian organizations, um, the Christian school, uh, of course, all of our parks, uh, churches, uh, the Masonic Hall, um, we, we've got a lot of organizations here that are not on the tax rolls. And to take one organization and to single them out saying that we're going to get a payment in lieu of taxes out of this organization because we may have the power to do that right now, I don't think is fair. I think if the council wants to address the payment in lieu of taxes for fire and police protection and for uh, <coughs> public works services, that should be done on a more broad basis and not just on one individual property. So. Alderman, well, I have nobody. Oh, Alderman Hammond. There we go. I think my light's in the corner somewhere. Um, first off, I'd you know, like to thank Alderman Bourne for at least bringing this forward. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with having the discussion about payment in lieu of taxes, but as I said before, to single out a particular organization when you've got groups like the American Legion um, who, of course, um, have a, a drinking establishment inside. Um, of course, the Elks, the Moose, many others. Um, if we want to have this discussion as a matter of policy, then I think we need to have that discussion. But if you look at the payback, it's going to be 20 plus years um, before, on, based on $700 before we recoup the cost that we could have to put into that building. Um, I think the other thing we, gotta, we have to consider is, yes, there's payment in lieu of taxes of $700, but what do these organizations put back into our community in the form of, of charitable work? You know, again, I, American Legion, um, many of these other organizations are benevolent and as such do many great things for this community that I would submit is probably greater than $700 a year in value. And then finally, the argument is plain, they can go anywhere else. They could find any other building in Sheboygan and unless we were gonna hold their liquor license hostage, um, would be off the tax rolls. So again, if we want to have this conversation as part of a larger policy decision, um, then we should bring that forward. But to pick on this one group and say, no, we're going to make you the example, I just don't think is fair. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Ryan. Uh, first, I've got a question. Uh, the 10 or 11 parking spots, are we cur currently getting any rent for those spots? Those are owned by, I, all, all, Attorney McLean mentioned that those are under the jurisdiction of the uh, transit or the par a parking utility? Mm -hmm. Under jurisdiction of the parking utility. Yeah, yeah I think they're, uh, you know, parking utility uh, assigns them and things, but most of those right behind the building are city employees, or at least they, they have been in the past. The ones farther south may be rented. I'm not even positive of that. Uh, but I, uh, although the ones for, uh, used by city employees, we do, there is a charge internally, the departments get charged for so much a stall per month. Uh, you know, so it comes out of departmental budgets if, if uh, they're using one of those stalls now, so. And then the other stalls would be used just for the general public if somebody, let's say, is working at a bank and they wanna rent a stall, they can rent it, or 
how, how, how do we get uh, rental from those, from those stalls? I guess what I'm driving at is that we have to kick the city employees out and move them somewhere else uh, for the nights, then that's gonna be less parking revenue because we won't have less stalls to rent to somebody else. Would that be correct? Well, a good number of those stalls were in engineering that is gone now anyway. That's down at the service building. Uh, I, I don't know who all has assigned stalls in there, but. The uh, Alderman Bourne, at the moment, we have no shortage of downtown parking uh, since the, the police department was moved out of this building. We have the metered lot right across the road mm -hmm. uh, that during the day is never more than 20% full. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a lot more parking right in this area than we have vehicles at the moment. Um, that, of course, is owned by the parking of parking authority also. Um, so we could move people over to there. We also have more stalls over here behind the building that are that are available also. Uh, and all, with all due respect, Mayor, some of the some of the lists that you read off of there, uh, I don't believe any of those own a bar or run a bar in the city. And that's what the Knights of Columbus is gonna be doing. And that's what they've been doing for years. And I guess, you know, the only time that you can get a tax exempt organization to even consider a pilot payment in lieu of taxes is when they want something. To give you an example, this is on a much bigger scale, but recently Aurora built a hospital in Grafton. The, the village of Grafton got $1 million out of Aurora Healthcare to help build a public works building down there and they're getting many thousands of dollars a year in lieu of property taxes before they could break ground. So as I say, the only time the city is in a good position to negotiate any pilots is when a nonprofit wants something. And right now they want something. Uh, Director Amodio, were they given the figure of $700 in your negotiations? Because I talked to Nancy about that today and it took her three hours to call me back. No, it was so actually more than that. We threw out a high number. Okay. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think in the spirit of things, I think you should try one more time to get the $700. If they've got their five slot machines and they're like the rest of the bars in town, they should be able to pay for that pilot in probably a week. Thank you. Thank you again, Alderman Boren. Alderman Sampson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple, couple questions. Have we had any other offers on that building at all? No. Nothing. And how long has it been technically for? We, we have not officially put that building on the market. Okay, so Knights, okay. of, Knights of Columbus came to us knowing that it was going to be vacated. We haven't had it on the market because uh, up until the end of this week, we still have engineering in the building. Okay. And who appraised the building? You said they got it appraised. Who appraised that? So it was an independent appraiser that they hired, they being Knights of Columbus. It was, uh, we had Ken, an appraised. Ken Sontag did the last appraisal on it, I believe, who also does the appraisals for yeah. Shipley. We had an appraisal. He's a reputable appraiser. Ken in the Sontag area. did this one too? Yes. Just for this deal? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I Thank believe you. they had Ken yeah. do it. Right. And Ken is a reputable appraiser in the area. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Bowers. Thank you. You know, here we have a Christian organization takes advantage of all our services. And I'd like to ask the people that negotiated this, what are their reasons for not paying Mr. Romano or whoever did the negotiations for not paying a um, payment in lieu of taxes, what their reasoning is. Don't they understand that we, if there's a fire, we're gonna be there. If there's gonna be an ambulance call, we're gonna be there. If there's gonna be a snowstorm, they're going, we're going to be there. Uh, the water utility, if something goes wrong, we'll fix it. They also get the water from the city. What, as Christians, what are they telling us the city of Sheboygan? Is it they don't want to do it or they can't afford it or what? Does anybody know that in your negotiations? They're non tax paying entity, so why should they pay taxes? See, that, that's the kind of reasoning we're getting, and I think they probably think they're going to set a precedent. So maybe there's something this council should look at as get all the organizations and maybe enact. I don't know if we can force them to do something, but we need money. And these people take up the services just as much as my home and your home and a businessman. And they're all made up of people that pay taxes. So why shouldn't uh, these organizations do something, maybe not taxes, but payment in lieu of taxes? Is that something we can look into? Uh, Alderman Bowers, that's one thing that if, if, I, I believe this council may want to look into if the council, uh, it would be this council's prerogative to look at it as a matter of policy, uh, citywide, 
rather than singling out one organization. You know, you speak of this being a good Christian organization. We have a, a good artist organization named the John Michael Kohler Art Center that uh, uh, doesn't pay taxes either. I understand you know? that. So, I mean, I, I just don't think it's fair to single out one organization, in my opinion. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> If there is none, roll call, please, and I vote would authorize the sale of the property as is. A we, got a we got a motion. We got a first. motion. To oh, amend. first we have, I'm sorry, Jim. First we have, <laughs> sorry, I jumped sorry. the gun there, Jim. No disrespect intended. Um, your motion, um, Jim, uh, states to, to just send it back to the city attorney and the finance director for further negotiations. Can we send this back to the city attorney and the finance director? Or does it have to go back to a committee? I, I think the preferable way would be to have it, if you're gonna refer it back, is refer it back to finance committee so that it's in the system uh, as opposed to sending it to department heads. Uh, uh, I think if it went to the finance committee with, with the uh, direction that the city attorney and the finance director negotiate, that's fine. I'll embed my motion then to send it to, to finance first. Okay, so the motion on the, rest the floor. Of the, word, the rest of the wording of the resolution remains the same. Okay, uh, an amendment to uh, Alderman Bourne's uh, resolution here or uh, uh, to send this back to the finance committee. So an I vote would be to send it to the finance committee for further discussion. A no vote will keep it uh, for a vote on the council floor. Roll call please. Alderman Rinfleisch. Uh, thank you. Before we vote, I'm just looking at the uh, commercial offer to purchase again. Um, the offer as made uh, must have acceptance by January 31st. Um, and I don't know if it goes back to committee, if it's going to be able to come back to council for final approval, so we call a special meeting by January 31st. That Basically, would, if we don't get back to them by January 31st, there is no offer. It would make that offer null and void. Exactly. So something to think about when it comes to the resolution as well. Alderman Rinfleisch, is there any further discussion before the vote on the amendment? There is no roll call, please. Heidemann? Aye. Koth? No. Kittleson? No. Montemayor? No. Rinfleisch? No. Raisler? No. Sampson? No. Vanderweel? No. Versi? Aye. Boren? Aye. Bauk? No. Bowers? Aye. Hammond? No. Hannah? No. Ten I, I'm sorry, four eyes, ten no's. Other way around. Okay. Motion fails. Uh, back to the original um, resolution authorizing the sale of the property, 20 50. Is there any further discussion? There is no discussion, and I vote will be to to authorize the sale of the property at 199,000 as is, a no vote will be to turn down that offer. Alderman Rinfleisch, you have a discussion? Vice yeah, President thank Rinfleisch. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I voted no so that the, the, um, on the amendment so that we can move to the commercial offer to purchase uh, and get this property um, off our hands before we have to invest a lot of money in there. Um, my hope, though, is that the Knights of Columbus or members thereof have heard uh, of the debate and um, hopefully do the right thing and uh, volunteer themselves to do a $700 contribution and payment in lieu of taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Rinfleisch. Is there any further discussion? If there is none, roll call, please. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Koth? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Versi? No. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Bowers? No. And Hammond? Aye. 11 ayes, 3 noes. Motion carries. Report of Committee 9, 2051 by Public Protection and Safety recommending creating Section 1847 of the muni Municipal Code <coughs> so as to place restrictions on dangerous and vicious dogs, amending Section 18-3 <laughs> of the Municipal Code so as to establish and increase certain penalties for violations of animal ordinances in the city and repealing and recreating section 18-46 so as to modify the city's leash law. PPNS. 
Alderperson Montemayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm glad you asked me to do this one because I feel strongly about this one. We had a good subcommittee, uh, good participants. It was uh, Alderman Versi, Alderman Sampson, myself, and we had a veterinarian, we had the Humane Society, <coughs> dog groomer, dog food seller. We had lots of the dog people who objected to our first request in that committee, and they gave us lots of good ideas, lots of good information. Um, Police Chief Domogolski was there. Um, Chuck Adams was there. I think, um, and their main concern was all the rules were good if it's a dog that is of danger to a community, a specific dog, not just a breed. So that is pretty much what we've done. <coughs> Alderman oh, Montemayor, motion. you need to make a motion. Thank you, I certainly do. <laughs> but it sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a motion that the RC be accepted and adopted and the ordinance be put upon its back. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Alderperson Montemayor. Under discussion. <coughs> President Kittleson? Um, well, yes, thank you, Mayor, I do. Um, so what changed here is you took away, we took away the breed specific portion of this. Is that it? Can someone answer that? I think Alderperson Montemayor and Versi and Samson and would then, be happy to. And then what are we gonna do as far as in, you know, it, the enforcement portion of it? And now I believe can, the CSOs can write citations. Would somebody like to give us a quick synopsis of quick the resolution? Ordinance. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead, Marilyn. Um, thank you. Uh, Alderman Kittleson, yes. that's pretty much it. And we also um, added that um, those retractable leashes should not be used. It should be a, a sturdy six foot leash or an eight foot leash that they actually can control. And even the veterinarians and Humane Society and all the other dog, dog people agreed with that strongly as well. And it will be the police who will now respond to these complaints and will have some sort of uh, ordinance to use to help them with the complaints, to enforce something. Thank you, Alderperson Montemayor. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mayor Ryan. Uh, I looked over the document and I liked the document, but I think the only shortcoming that I can see is, or maybe somebody on the committee can answer this, is what is this gonna do to increase people to license their dogs? Uh, I think there was, uh, some of the uh, veterinarians were willing to do it in their office if they were given a fee to cover their administrative costs, but that fell by the wayside. Can anybody tell me why that wasn't in the final document? Thank you. Chuck Adams talked to the county about that, and the county clerk felt very strongly that would not be legal for us to do that or for veterinarians to do that. Now, Chuck Adams disagreed with that, but he didn't feel it was worth causing the commotion right now about that. Veterinarians were willing to do that, the city was willing to do that, but the county clerk was not. She felt very strongly it was not legal, and it is the county that is issuing the licenses. We're just doing it for the county. Thank you, Alderperson Montemayor. Alderman Sampson? Thank you, Mr. Ray. I, I think it's, the licensing issue, I think, is gonna be something totally different that we're gonna have to work on in the future. It's gonna be ongoing. I think uh, very important to note here is now we have a process in place that once we established that there is a dog, and we took the breed specific portion out of it because that was the highly emotional part of it. That was a big part that we took out. Uh, but we also added a, a process now that if there is a dog that is deemed dangerous or vicious, uh, you get your citation, you can challenge it. Now, we, we didn't really have that. There's, a, there's more of a distinct process now that they can challenge that through the city and, and, and they, can, they can argue that. So at, at, at some point, if they believe that they were unfairly targeted or whatever, they can certainly bring that up and they can argue that now and they'll be heard uh, and it'll be taken into consideration at that point. But I think it's important now we have now a process in place that actually gives the police something and the city something that we can do with addressing dangerous dogs and vicious dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sampson. Alderman Vice President Rinflesh. Uh, thank you. Um, I had received a call earlier today uh, from a constituent with some questions on that. Um, I don't know if, if the, the person had seen it online or wherever it was, but uh, had some pretty specific questions. First, under definitions, uh, definition of a dangerous, do vicious dog, excuse me, 
the concern was number two, cause an injury by biting a person in the face or neck. Uh, and there is no other further definition on that. And the question was, if I have a dog inside my house, protecting my house, and someone breaks in and bites somebody in the neck or face, doing their duty, is that now considered a vicious dog? Uh, but then they further looked at and said, uh, in section two, um, a dog, except one, assisting peace officer, etc. cetera. Um, and there it says, chase or attack any human being or domestic animal without provocation. And the assumption was then, someone in my, breaks into my house, that's provocation, my dog's not going to be deemed a, a, a vicious dog. And the further point then they made was that, well, then I see that there's a whole process for notification hearing of declaration of a dangerous dog. So for the public, if uh, someone on the committee could kind of go through the process if, uh, of declaration, uh, a bite occurs, is it automatically a dangerous dog, or does it have to go through this process first? That was basically the question, is to see what rights do the dog owners have for declaration of a dangerous dog, or is it simply just an appeal of that process? Thank well, you. if somebody breaks into your house, you hope they're tall, so the dog like <laughs> bites them in the arms or shoulders or something. Not the face of that. Alderman Versi? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know you want sure. to speak on this. Right. So yeah, and actually in, in section 3A, it actually de defines that. When it, when it defends its owner, caretaker, or another person or animal of a young food from a trespasser or an attack by that person or animal, that sums it up in one little sentence right there for those people. Any, anything inside their home, let them attack. As, <laughs> as far as, as them appealing it, it's once that dog has bitten in the face or neck outside of their own surroundings, unprovoked, they can go ahead and appeal it if they want and say, well, it, it was provoked by the person teasing with whatever, but now they have to prove their case. That's where it comes to, yeah, you can appeal anything you want, but now you have to prove it. So, I mean, the, the, the appealing matter is once it's unprovoked, and then they're deeming it dangerous or vicious right away. Paul, uh, the proving, uh, the onus is not on the owner to prove it's not a vicious dog. The, the proving is on the police or in the court proceeding to prove it is a vicious dog. So. It, it seems, you know, it's half six in one hand, half a dozen in the other, but the rights of the property owner is, is still intact, uh, that owns the dog, that um, someone simply can't claim it's a vicious dog and then you have to prove it's not. How do you um, disprove a negative, I guess? It's that it has to be proven as a vicious dog first. So your rights as a, pro a pet owner are still protected. I think with the balance of this committee, um, with the so-called dog people, as all the person Montemayor referred to them, and I guess the others would be the non-dog people, uh, we had a pretty good balance, so if this committee came up with this document and they all agreed on it, I think that, uh, I think that is a, a good accomplishment. They agreed with it enthusiastically. Enthusiastically, that's yeah. even better. So, I, I think the committee it must have been, uh, I'm sure, many long hours of spirited discussion. <laughs> Alderman Bowers? Yes, thank you. So let me get this straight, our person, uh, Montemir, and your committee, uh, our attorney, Chuck Adams, who has knowledge of the law, said he thought it was legal. We have a county clerk that says, no, this isn't legal. I can see why you people didn't want to go through with this because you wanted to get the body in effect in that fight city hall. What is our procedure now to instigate where the county clerk, because she's looking at it this way, she's got 11,000 license to issue probably. So she doesn't want the extra work. This is what it's all about. Not and <clears throat> what can we do to get the county, uh, do we, is it one of our committees to instigate this so that the county issues it or what? That's the next committee, not tonight. <laughs> well, okay, I'm not saying your committee, no. What, what's the procedure that we can go about because we, our city attorney thinks it's illegal. The work. So why can't we instigate something? And I, I believe that somebody could come in with another resolution um, uh, strictly uh, regarding dog licensing and probably we could discuss the, the matter of dog licensing and, and open that up for more discussion or Alderman I'll, Versi. Yeah, I'll add to that. Right. It becomes, because since it is Sheboygan County licenses, the city can only, cannot delegate what the county does. That was the issue that the county clerk had or, is they issue the license. We're issuing them on their behalf because they're city residents. So uh, the county board would have to take on the licensing issue, not us. So we would need to contact the county board and talk them into pushing the veterinarians to process licenses. If that answers your question. Yes. All right. In other words, that's one thing that's very rarely heard around here. It's, said, it's called a call your county board member. <laughs> Who are they? 
<laughs> Alderman Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I just want to clarify the one statement by Alderman Versi. Even though they are in their house, that doesn't give the owner free reign and let the dog just bite people like crazy. They have to be doing, that person that's in the house has to be doing something unlawful. It isn't just a, you can have a vicious bite inside the house and that person not be doing something illegal or unlawful. So uh, it just, just to clarify, it's not just because they're in their house, they can just bite and then it, that won't be taken into consideration just so there's no confusion. I thought I, the gist of it I got was Alderman Vice President Rinfleisch was referring to intruders. I'd like to add one last thing. I don't sell liability Promise. insurance for dogs. Okay, <laughs> just want to put that out there at TV land. I don't sell liability insurance for dogs. You'd have to talk to Alderman Hannah about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. About Hammond. Anybody else? Okay. Nobody sells insurance for dogs here. That's good. Okay. Any further discussion? If there is none, roll call, please. Kath. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Raisler. Aye. Sampson. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Versi. Aye. Boren. Aye. Bauk. Aye. Ham, I'm sorry, Bowers. Aye. Hammond. Aye. Hannah. Aye. And Heidemann. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. 25th, uh, ordinance is introduced 10, 2052 and 2053 to be referred. Other matters authorized by law, Attorney McLean. 2054 is an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from Marge Mattern stating her concerns over spending $25,000 to install cameras in the municipal courtroom. I think we could file that. Mm -hmm. Motion to file? Second. second. We have a motion and a second to file. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 2055. Is an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from Dick Susha regarding tax incremental financing districts. That will be referred to city planning. 2056 is a communication from Janelle Kunert of Washington School requesting a change in the location and wording of the signage for the Washington Elementary School Circle Drive. Will be referred to public protection and safety. 2057 is a summons complaint in the matter of Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority versus Chad Koisman et al. Will be referred to risk management. 2058 is a resolution establishing public participation procedures for the City of Sheboygan Comprehensive Plan update. Will be referred to city planning. 2059 is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2011 and June 30, 2012. We'll go to Vice President Rinfleisch and Law and Licensing. Okay, that is all for uh, other matters. Uh, looking for a motion to go into closed session. Uh, for those folks out there, we will not be coming back on the air. Uh, we have a closed session to discuss uh, to discuss some matters. There will not be a vote on any matters. It's for information purposes only. Okay. Motion to move into second. Into second. We have a motion and a second to go into closed session. Do you want to read the whole thing, please? I can do that. Motion to convene in closed session under the exemption provided in section 19.851 of the Wisconsin statutes for the purpose of deliberating the purchasing of public property the investing of public funds and the possible modification, renegotiation, and assignment of leasehold interests where competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of going into closed session say aye. Aye. Opposed? We are in closed session. We can have the door shut, please.